up, they don't do their service, you know, they become useless because of insincerity. And this is the same thing. This is why the Lord appears in this material world, is to stop this kind of nonsense, uh, to, to save us from ourselves. Because if we make a false promise to his representative, we're finished. It's one thing to make a false promise to just anybody. But when you make a false promise to the representative of the Lord, this is a very serious mistake. Huh? It's just like, you know, if you, make a, if you make a false promise to just anybody, you know, oh, yes, uh, I'm going to take you uh, to, to the prom next year, you know, and then you don't do it. Well, that's not such a big deal. But if you make a false promise to a judge, oh, yes, Your Honor, I'll appear in court next month, uh, you know, don't worry. And then you don't do it, you're in trouble. Why? Because the judge is a representative of the power of the government. Similarly, the spiritual master or the transcendentalist, the devotee, uh, is a representative of the truth of the Lord. He stands for the word of honor of God. Uh, when God says, Ye yata mang prapadyante, as they approach me, I respond accordingly. As they surrender unto me, I reward them accordingly. As, I lo as they love me, I respond, I reciprocate accordingly. So therefore, the spiritual master uh, is not a person to be trifled with. The spiritual master is not someone to play around with. Huh? If you make a false promise to the spiritual master, God takes this very seriously. It's an offense. So we should be very careful to avoid offenses in dealings with the spiritual master or advanced devotees, uh, because God takes this very seriously. Therefore, the first qualification of a real devotee is truthfulness. And you'll see there are several lists of qualities that are given in the scriptures about what is a real transcendentalist. And they, they all begin, or, or at least uh, the more important qualities given are truthfulness. Truthfulness, sincerity, you know, uh, freedom from lies and deceit. Uh, a, a devotee is defined in one place of the scripture as someone who doesn't put anyone into anxiety. Uh, so the devotee is always very humble. The devotee never takes offense on his own account. A devotee never says, you cheated me, you're bad. You know, uh, because it's the living entity's own responsibility how he performs his different actions. Uh, he's going to have to take the reaction. We don't have to take the reaction. If someone cheats us, if someone lies to us, if someone does, or any, does anything demoniac, uh, like here on Yaksha, he, he was born in a very high family, but what did he do? He used his powers to destroy the, the earth and throw it into the ocean. Uh, so even though he had a lot of advantages, he had a lot of good qualities, he had a lot of powers, he misused those powers. And because of that, he was killed by the Lord. So similarly, if someone has the privilege of association with a Vaishnava and they make offenses to the Vaishnava, then they're responsible for the reaction. We're not responsible. So we don't care. I mean, Leia, let somebody say whatever they like. Let, let them do whatever they like. We don't care. Because they have to take the reaction. We don't have to take the reaction. Uh, everyone is responsible. Just like the captain of a ship. Uh, the captain of the ship is responsible. If the ship hits a rock or goes off course or sinks in a storm or something like that, the captain is held responsible. Not the first mate, not the bosun, not the engineer, the captain. So we're all captains of our own ship. This material body is, is, called, is in the Srimad Bhagavatam. This human body is called a ship that can take us across the ocean of material nescience. So we're each captain of our own ship. And according to the decisions we make, then we have to bear the responsibility. Just like right now we're talking about Karma Yoga on the site. 
I've made a lot of posts about karma yoga. I'm a little surprised there hasn't been any discussion about it uh, because it's actually a very important topic that everybody should be really clear about. Karma yoga means that instead of performing our activities for our own personal benefit, we perform them for the benefit of the Lord. And if we follow this philosophy to its logical conclusion, that means we surrender 100% to the Lord and we do everything for Him. And this is the position of a pure devotee. So karma yoga is actually the mechanism or the, the method by which we can become a pure devotee. So everyone should practice karma yoga at least to the degree that they can. Uh, so far we've been talking about the position of the soul and we've been based uh, on the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita, the uh, revelations of the actual nature and position of the soul. But now we're advancing. We want to progress. So we're going into the third chapter. And in the third chapter, the Lord reveals karma yoga. So karma yoga is the practical application of the Sankhya philosophy given in the second chapter. The Sankhya means discrimination or distinction. So by Sankhya, we can distinguish between spirit and matter. Once we have successfully understood Sankhya Yoga and understood that we are an eternal spirit soul, well, what's the next step? We have to apply that philosophy. It's not just theory. It's not just armchair spirituality. Uh, this path of the esoteric teaching is practical. It's grounded. It's real. It's tangible. It's to be executed with our whole uh, mind, body, senses, heart, everything. Okay, nothing left out. If we left anything out, then it wouldn't be the absolute truth because the absolute truth encompasses everything. So that means karma yoga is something that we do in practice to reflect our understanding of spiritual life in theory. And if we understand the theory properly, then we'll surrender completely. Huh? You know, just like uh, Uddhava and Florian are here. And also, oh, the big news this week is that Connor is coming. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> so end of March, Connor will also be here. And um, Neville's also thinking about coming later on in the year. And uh, Solus and so many other people. And we're looking forward to having them here because it means we actually get to perform karma yoga. In karma yoga, all of our work is dedicated to the service of the Lord. That means we get up early in the morning, we chant our mantras, we study the scriptures. When we cook, we cook for the Lord. When we clean, we clean for the Lord. Huh? All the things that people do normally anyway. But instead of doing them for our service, we do it for the Lord's service. And what does that mean? We're released from the karma from those activities. So even though like Uddhava, for example, is working in the technical field, uh, doing field service on, on complicated equipment and stuff like that for some rascal business, still, he doesn't get any karma from that. He's released from that karma because he's applying the results to service of the Lord. Okay, uh, or just like um, when I was, uh, before I was a devotee, I was a musician. And even though I was in a really good band and, you know, I had good skills and all of that, I wasn't really happy. But then I became a devotee and within a year or so, I was traveling around and using my musical abilities to present Krishna consciousness to people. And oh, I was very happy. That was really nice. Because why? I wasn't getting any karma from those activities. The same activity or similar activity of being a musician uh, in, applied in one way generates karma and you get bad reactions. Applied in another way, it frees you from karma. Uh, it's just like the principle of homeopathic medicine. In homeopathic medicine, you make a medicine from the very same thing that causes the symptoms that the patient has got. Okay, so the very same thing applied in one way causes a disease and applied in a different way cures the disease. That's the principle of karma yoga. In karma yoga, the very same activities 
that cause us bondage to the material world and karma can free us from these things and actually become the mechanism of how we attain liberation from material existence. This is so simple, so direct, so practical, and yet most people can never do it huh? because they have this attachment to the results of their activities. Oh, I worked so hard and then I should be able to enjoy. Huh? So this desire to enjoy, this lusty attitude, this attachment to the results of the activities that we perform is what causes our entrapment in the material world. That's why we're here, because of that attitude. And the cure for that attitude can only be taking the results of those same activities and then sacrificing them in Krishna consciousness.